by love languages, a dynamic book. They've got one for uh, courting, they got one for friendship, they even have one for children. But what is behind this sudden surge of people trying to do soul search? People realize that my life is either stagnating or breaking down because I don't fully get me. And you know what the hypocritical thing is? We expect people to try to understand somebody that we're trying to learn. You know, you get mad at people understanding you when you barely understand yourself. There is not a philosophy behind what, why you do what you do, why you like who you like, why you're consistent with the stuff you are, so etc., etc. The point is there is a light on us trying to figure ourselves out. Now, certain faiths, if we call them that, journeys, routes, perspectives, all before I give you my point today, they encourage soul searching. I'm going to go on this journey and I'm going to find myself. Some of you say that crap all the time. I'm about to, I need to find myself. Why don't you just tell a girl she ugly and you don't want her? Don't just tell her you need to find yourself. Yourself ain't the one that's long, you know. Hey, I need to find myself. I'll find myself. That's how we use things to dismiss ourselves from stuff that we feel bad about. But guess what? If you go on some introspective journey to your soul, you're going to be lost. Because the way you find you is not by looking within. If you look within, the thought is that you are the founder of you. And you are not your idea. So soul searching ain't going to give you no clarity. It's going to give you confusion. Because you're going to run into all the people you've been hosting in that joker. You're going to find addiction, stress, control, Jezebel, lust, abandonment, fear, worry. You're going to find a bunch of stuff taking a Dorothy Explorer trip to your past. So how do I get the confidence, the courage, the stamina to move forward? Our identity begins in him. It does not begin in you. It begins in him. Isn't that a breath of fresh air? Because if I got to start at the beginning of my story, I'm damned already. My God. How many of you know you are a mess in progress? You have got to be able to evaluate yourself in a level deeper than your history, your family, your heritage, your exposures, or your experiences. It's got to begin in him. Ask me why. Because that's where the objective version of you began. The Bible says you were in him from before the foundation of the world and you were chosen to be in him. So if you start trying to investigate your life journey on an earth level, you're going to end up in trouble. Yeah. You've got to understand that you're found in him. Now we can go to our scriptures. John chapter 10 verse 30. Let's hurry up and go there. If we can get it up there, that would be a, a tremendous help. John chapter 10 verse 30. Thank you, Father. John chapter 10 verse 30. We're going to look at some concepts today and I'm going to teach you and uh, we're going to break some yokes off your life with this teaching. John chapter 10 verse 30. Very simple verse. Uh, if you don't have it on your uh, Apple device. You, um, what's that other thing? <laughs> that end time evil. <laughs> then you can look on the screen can look on the screen, okay? All right, let's read the scripture together. You ready? Hold on, let me invite Scope Tempo. All right. Let's read it together. I and my Father are one. Let's say it again one more time. I and my Father are one. Now, that statement, I'm going to spare you from the byproduct of it. But we're only going to use that one particular angle because verse 2 of that, or the second part of that, was a very, very, very bad ending to how people responded to that statement. The scriptures actually say, and Jesus said, I and my father are one, and then they picked up stones and tried to kill him. <laughs> so they did not uh, celebrate, anticipate, or expect that as a compliment to God because ne never before had a man made himself equal with God. Does this make sense to you? Now, let's go to the scripture that shows us what he meant with that. Go to John 17. John 17. Because I'm going to give you insight into what Jesus meant when he said that. I and my Father are one. Go to John 17. Now, how many of you know our Father? Would y'all have a holla be that name, that kingdom come? Y'all know that? Now, the way that it's taught historically is that that is the, the Lord's Prayer, when factually it is the model prayer. When the disciples come to Jesus and say, teach us to pray, 
Jesus never said to them, this is how I do it. What he said to them is, pray this way. So it was a skeleton, a rubric, uh, uh, like a pattern for the process of prayer and how to do it right. But John's gospel actually gives us access and insight to the types of stuff Jesus prayed about. So this is the first time we see the prayer life of Jesus in John 17 and 9. You ready? Put it up, Remy. John 17 and 9. We're about to do some work in understanding what Jesus meant when he said, I am my father, I want. John 17, 9. Now look at Jesus' prayer, Jesus prayer life. I pray for who? Yeah. Who? Yeah. He says, but I pray not for the world. Look at me. We open this up by letting us know why we need to learn God as Abba. Because here is something that's going to shut down the majority of the lies in our culture about God. And it is this. We are all, say all. all. We are all his creation, but we are not all his children. One of the primary doctrines and lies about God in Western culture is that everybody belongs to him. But belonging to him happens in response to what you do with what he's done. It doesn't happen just because you exist. That is a major misconception. I'll dig into that a little later. But the, the people think that because God is the idea and the brains and the genius behind every life on the planet, then that makes us all his sons. And that's not true. As a matter of fact, Paul says, before you come into the kingdom, you are alien. You are a stranger. A citizen of darkness. And then the Bible actually says... You belong to your father, the devil. So your journey from darkness to light does switch of us. When you are in destruction and you welcome destructive patterns and tendencies, it does not reflect the nature of God, but that place has a source as well. Hallelujah. And so we all are his creature, but we are not all his sons. Jesus says, I pray for them. I don't pray for the world. But for them that thou hast given me. Let's do a little bit of reading. For they are who? Thine. And all, and all mine are thine. And thine are mine. For I am glorified in them. Verse 11. And now I am no more in the world. But these are in the world. And I come to thee. This is Jesus praying. Holy Father, keep through thine own name those who thou hast given me. Look at this language. That they may be one. Shout it. That they may be one. How? As we are. Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Uh, those that thou gavest me, I have kept. And none of them is lost. Glory to God. Except the son of perdition. Speaking about Ju uh, Judas. Uh, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Verse 13. And now I come unto thee, and these things I speak in the world, that they might have the, my joy fulfilled in themselves. Verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated them, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. He's still praying. Verse 15. I pray not, not for all you rapture people that can't wait to die and get to heaven. I pray not that thou would take them out of the world, but that you would keep them from evil. So when people teach and preach that the main point of your salvation is heaven, it's a that's what Jesus prayed. People were getting forgiveness from sin through bulls and goats. You didn't need a Messiah to get you to heaven. You need a Messiah to get heaven to earth. So when people are like, just give me up out of here in the great big the morning, very well, very well. Everybody who wants to die to the early church, there's a shipment going out tomorrow at 1230. Jesus' prayer for those that were his was not to take them, but to leave them. So that what he was in them could be manifest to the world. Does this make sense to you? I made y'all mad already. I need to start preaching. He says, don't take them from the world, but keep them from evil. Boy, 
They are not of the world. Even as night, I am not of the world. Verse 7, here come a cuss word. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I sent them in the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself. What a thought. What a thought. I sanctify myself for their sakes, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me because of them. He's basically saying, I'm praying for them, but I'm praying for those that will know me because of them. Those that their word and their message will affect it. Now, let's lift up. This is where our substance is coming from in verse 21. Now, this is the most reading y'all done all week. That's why y'all quiet. Look at verse 21. Listen. That they all may be, scream this word. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us. That the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So without this phenomena of becoming one, there is an obstacle in what the world can see about Jesus. It's like he can't get through to the world if we don't know what it is to be made one with the Father. Does that make sense to you? Verse 23, let's look at this again. I in them and thou in me that they may be made perfect in one and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So let's do some work. I want to break down some of this language in Jesus' prayer. Because when we read this prayer of Jesus, we read it like Jesus is talking about unity. Let's all get on one accord. That's all. But how many of you know unity and oneness are not the same? This is not Jesus praying to get us to all agree on the same stuff. Nor is this Jesus' prayer to put division aside. Interesting, right? It's oneness. Which is existing in something else. The two become one. The Bible says about marriage. But just because the two become one. Don't mean that they always agree. Now you say. How can two walk together. Except they be agreed. That was not a verse about relationships. As you get for only going to Sunday school. That was a verse. About God and earth. Not you and your brother. Our unity cannot be based on agreement. But because our unity has been based on us thinking and feeling the same about everything, we can't achieve oneness. So oneness was the objective of this prayer. Does this make sense to you so far? Okay, so let's dig into this. We have already established that our identity is found in him. So why is that a challenge? When I'm talking to you about your identity, your destiny, your purpose, and what you know about yourself, why is it a challenge for people to find it in God? I'll tell you why. One of God's major issues is trying to relate to you individually past your experiences. Because whether you realize it or not, we don't really learn God according to truth or according to the Bible. We learn him based upon where we've been and what's happened to us. And where we've been and what's happened to us, pay attention, gives us language, convictions, definitions, conclusions, expectations that become an interference to God trying to relate to us directly. Now, how do we realize that this shows up? Because it is often like because our experiences are very real to us. Reaching for a principle that we've not experienced is not easy to do. I'll make that clear in a minute. So, when I'm talking to you about how to understand your identity, and that's the, the, the basis of every decision you make, it's important that we start with how you really see God. I'm not about the churchy stuff. Pray your friend, let's mother with your mother. Because some of us say that because they're good lyrics. But we've got to deal with how you see God, because how you see Him determines how you respond to Him. If we can't deal with how you see the Lord, we can't really deal with how you react or respond to what he says, does, or wants for you. Say amen. amen. Where is maturity found? In responses. In reactions. 
If you want to know how mature or immature a person is in God, you measure and you judge their response. Your salvation started with what? A response. Nobody comes to me except I draw him. So he did drawing and you did what? Responded. Now where is revival? Where is wholeness? Where is unity? It's in the absence of the right responses to God. So it's not that we're not responding, we're responding the wrong way because our basis for him is based upon what other people have done to us. All right, are y'all with me? Say amen so I know y'all not sleep. God's identity is under attack by the experiences of your life, the flaws in your theology, the ideas of your culture. You know, y'all let America tell y'all God is love, but they don't even believe in it. So y'all are taking ideas on what God is from people who hate him. We are letting people who are not submitted to him teach us how he is and what we got folks talking about. Would Jesus do that? Well, how would you know? So we got a challenge in the earth. And the challenge that we have in the earth is God is trying to get through to people who believe what they've heard and won't get to experience him individually. Past pain, regret, trauma, lies. Now if this is uncomfortable, then you're going to really squeal in a couple of minutes. So the healthy way to experience God is by revelation and truth. Not by what goes on around you. It is how we see him. That Now, here's why it's another bad thing. Real quick. To identify God based upon your experiences. Is because experiences are not reliable. Experiences change. What you feel, what you go through. Even what you want, what you desire. Those are not trustworthy sources of information. You know, we have got to stop acting like our feelings know it all. Yeah. We're quiet today. You've got to stop acting like this because you feel it, that it's absolute true. I ask people all the time, how you know you call me this? Because I just feel it. I just feel it all in my body. You can feel a lot of stuff, you know? You don't have to, when it comes to doctrine, you don't answer doctrinal things because it popped up, you just felt it. But what do you do with gas? What do you do with a headache? What do you do with a backache? Do those things dictate your life because you felt it? Glory to God. If you listen to your feelings, you'll end up in mess. You'll end up in wrong lovers. you end up in wrong careers. you end up in wrong habits. We take a lot of insight from how we feel. Why? Because orphans live defensively. And a part of defensive living is that I take my cue from what happens around me and not from who I am. When I don't realize who I am, then I can let who I am what I do or what I don't do. I let my heart tell me what to do. So that's a major obstacle with our relationship with God. God trying to prove himself to you and you believe what you heard. Or where you've been or what you feel. You ready to go deeper? Hell has a customized, personalized, very methodical plan for everybody in this room. I know that's not good news. Some of you cooperate with it. Some of you don't know it. But to every purpose, there has to be a plot. So if God has a purpose for your life, Satan has to have an opposite agenda to push against the purpose of God. You ready to do some work? So the difference in the attack may differ person to person, potential to attention, potential. So your temptations are not going to be the same as mine. Your tests will be the same as mine. Your attacks will be the same as mine. But there are two things that are the ultimate vision of Satan for every life. And the first one beyond your salvation is the abandonment of your purpose. He, he, he's okay with you living just as long as you're living without purpose because then you're dead anyway. Yeah. So the first thing is life without purpose. It makes you a zombie and you can't do anything to him if you're living life meaningless. Actually, if you're living life without a purpose, destruction is the only other way you can go. Destruction is the way people live when they don't know who they are. Does that make sense to you? But what is his grander objective? What is his grander idea? Satan's massive goal, I want you to pay attention because this is where we're going to do work is separation from God. Sin, sinfulness, 
your own or what you've inherited, the most powerful or impacting aftermath of sin is separation from God. And you're like, whoa, that's deep. What does that have to do with your scriptures? Because Jesus, who is the pattern son, and he reveals what sonship is to God and how to see God as Father. And he makes a statement, I and my Father are one. Say it. One. But the real word is inseparable. How many of you have ever lived life in sin? Be truthful. That's all of us, right? Put your hand down. If you got saved, joined the church, did the right hand of fellowship drunk you or whatever, however your process was, and you didn't deal with separation anxiety that came from the life you used to live, even though you talk in tongues and dance, you still don't see God the same way. Because one of the consequences of sin is the lens that determines how you see God. Satan knows separation works all the time. So Jesus says, I and the Father are one. The, 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 the disciples cry, show us the Father. And he's like, have you been with me so long that you're asking me, if you have seen me, who have you seen? The Father. I only do as I see my, what is he revealing? The power of being inseparable. I'm coming to you. Satan's plan for all of your life is very well measured, very well plotted, very well allotted for, but his ultimate objection, listen, is to make you live separated, think separated, believe separated, and act separated. Now, how does this get complicated? Sin and iniquity, Isaiah 59 and 2 is the scripture you need to write down from this. I'm going to show you how sin separates from God. Isaiah 59 and 2 says this, but your iniquities or inherited sin has separated you between you and your God and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. So we started a lot of our journeys with God off because most of our preachers preached him distantly, preached him afar off exhibited him as if he was not interested in being touched and certainly was not interested in coming in you and if he did it was only for tongues and screaming but certainly not to relate with human experiences and human challenges and human desires and human pains so you and I no matter how swaggy you look right now or how expensive your shirt is you got separation issues mm, I know you do you have issues with being separated. And a part of separation anxiety is panic. It allows for certain fears to come in your life. You ready for me to come down your road? Or anybody that has been the victim of the automatic failure mechanism. You don't know God as Father. Lean in. Lean in now. There is no way you can fail the Father. I'm gonna, I want that to hit you. I want it to hit you. You can't fail the Father. You can't fail the Father. You cannot fail a Father. When people don't know God as Abba, they don't see failure as an event. They see it as an identity. And people say, I don't want to be a failure. Instead of saying, I'm afraid of failing. But when you are a son who relates to a father, a failure does not change your name. It does not change your outcome. It does not change your DNA. It does not change your features. It is an event and it is not a destination. We are afraid to start anything because of the likelihood that we may pay. Meaning, when I you do something, I reward you. You do something, I reward you. You make A's, I reward you. You do that, I reward you. But God is not a transactional God. He has already given you everything you need. That's 
supplied you. Failure. Failure is one of the shadows that our identity lurks under because most of the stuff you got the potential to do and you won't because of the fear that I may fail. But let me ask you a question. I'm not going to preach it. How do you fail a guy who can't be surprised? But the, you know, the, the, the idea with, with letting God down is almost comical because if you say you can let God down, it means that you can catch him off guard. But how does a guy who knows everything before it happened, never sleeps, never slumbers, knows all the hair on your head, you think he looks at something you do and says, oh my God, I would never expect, no, 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 no. He That's trying to fight this like that because that's too good to be true. Do you know what that is? That's your natural father. That's your natural dad. Whose relationship with you was reward based. I show up on birthdays. I show up at prom. I give you $20 if you make an A. You are not otherwise. So our relationship with God is not based on a reward system. That's the barrier. God is like, I know that that's how they act down there, but I am not that way. Do not reward it with me. Why don't you say it, man? He, he's proving that he is there irrespective of what you do. So failure. I am a credential Bible student. Not one in my head. I got papers to prove it. A church guy. All my life I've heard, I'll never leave you, nor forsake you. I'll be with you always, even to the ends of the earth. And I've always thought about this scripture in context of Jesus leaving and sending the Holy Ghost. I thought that was his idea, you know. Oh yeah, I'll never leave you. I don't want to leave you as old as You know what fascinated me when I began to study this? That verse, that language is actually said more times in the Old Testament. Than the new. God was telling Israel, I will not forsake you in Exodus. So by the time Jesus starts saying it, he was only reiterating and repeating the matter of what he heard from the Father. Now, why is it so scrambled like eggs in your head? Because the only thing we think Jesus came to do was shed blood and die. He came. Of oneness is both vertical and horizontal. 
When we read Jesus' issue, we like, yeah, Lord, make us one. As the body of Christ, we come together. We can march and say some dumb prayers on the street. Let's just come together. Hi, yeah. <laughs> but that's not the oneness Jesus prayed into. Jesus prayed into getting you in God and him in you so that you can adequately see what you were capable of in the world. Now, Satan wants to fight how secure you feel with becoming a son to God. Be an entrepreneur, be a wife, be a mother, be the boss. Don't learn how to be a son. He's going to fight through your life. I'm coming for you. With whether or not you ever decide it's okay to be a son to God. There's a lot of ways he does it. I'm going to tell you how. But he wants to be inseparable from you. Does this make sense to you? Does this make sense to you? Why does hell hate? The Bible says to as many as believed on him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Why is it such a nerve for Satan? Because the last time a son was on the earth, his plan was forever wrong. So if he let you become a son, then his plans are going to be ruined again. Yeah. He only had to face one son before. Yeah. So if he's making sons around the world, yeah. he's going to have literally hell to pay. <laughs> because he only got only sent one son. Yeah. And it messed up a lot of his plans forever. But now that he's trying to make you sons, yeah. he's going to be frustrated. So prophesy. Cast out the devil. Sing, twirl, run. Don't learn how to respond to heaven like a son. Sonship is about perspective, response, and obedience. Say inseparable. inseparable. Now, can I dig in this a little deeper? When Jesus says, I and the Father am one, we are inseparable. When he says, God, make them inseparable, or oh, one in me and in you, and however he mixed it uh, verbally. You know what he was praying for? Immediately after we start looking at the word father, what's the first thing that comes in your mind? Creator. You begin in the loins of your father, right? A beginning point. And that's not a difficult concept for you to believe, right? You're like, yeah, I began that God is the one who made me. I'm going to tell you where the trouble comes in. Immediately after you see God the Father as creator, he goes into showing you that he is consistent and that he desires closeness. Now, look at your life. Look at your mammy, your mama's life. <laughs> look at your daddy's life. This is true. When you think closeness, father is not the word that comes to mind. Tell the truth. When you think closeness, you think mama or grandmama. When you think father, you don't think closeness. You think TV. You think sports. You think sofas. You think basements, you think a lot of stuff. Closeness is not a synonym. Don't get quiet because it's gonna make me do worse. Closeness is not a synonym. So because Satan has got to keep you out of wanting to be a son, he's got to use non-close earthly examples to make us believe that that's how God is and how heaven operates. Even further, when many of you think father, you don't think consistent. You may think available, you may think there, but you don't think consistency. It was the design of God for fathers to be consistent. Or other words, do a series of things very regularly all the time to your advantage. So now it's not difficult to conceptualize. We're trying to get these Negroes to not run from paying child support. And we wonder why it's difficult for us to believe that God is consistent. And that he wants to be close. Y'all daddies is running from y'all. Give me the money under the table. So it makes it di difficult for us to respond to God like he's consistent. Because our earthly examples taught us otherwise. Forsaken. Forsaken, forsaken. That, that, that issue of the separation anxiety shows up when a person lives their lives in a forsaken state. 
a forsaken condition, dropped, walked out or not there, inconsistent. All of that stuff has parts to play in what you know about your identity. God says, or Jesus tells us, Father, be one in them. Make them one in me, even as we are one together. And make them, give them the highest form of intimacy. When you think intimacy, you think boyfriend, girlfriend, maybe best friend. You don't think daddy. Listen, y'all hear that? That's why y'all so quiet. You don't think daddy. You think money. Let me go to him and need something. You think... Oh, he's a hard worker. All of those are good, but the foundation of the Father is consistent. Being owned by your faith. Willing to take credit for both your successes and your failures. You need this teaching in your life. Most of us cannot conceptualize the consistency of God. Because of the inconsistencies of people. Jesus says, secure them in you by giving them the highest form of intimacy. So the highest form of intimacy is not closeness, it's oneness. I and my father are one. You see me, you see him. I am in him, he is in me. Now how does this affect you? Have you ever really dealt with shame? You just lying, devil. I said, have you dealt with shame? What about embarrassment? What about condemnation? You see, here's why sin is so powerful. Because it brings these things. Sin started with a voice. So let's say the act of sin is over. Just because the act of sin is over does not mean that you're free from the effects of the act. Because a part of what comes with sin is embarrassment, is alienation, is condemnation, is dishonesty, is, is, is a lot of other stuff. And we're dealing with the sin. Lord, forgive me. I didn't mean to say it. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't mean to. But we're not dealing with the effects of the sin, which is condemnation. The sin life comes with condemnation. Because that's the glue that keeps you in sin. If you do a sin, let's say you go out today and you smoke weed, right? And you're like, Lord, forgive me for what I'm about to do. And then you get done, you're like, Lord, because you know, if you're a church guy, you know you pre repent sometimes. Don't lie. Forgive me for everything I'm about to do today. Thank you. Right. And you're like, Lord, forgive me for the sin if it be a hold the wheel. If you, only you can if you hold the wheel, man. You know? And the act is dealt with. But that repentance does not deal with the conversations that are going to follow in your soul. You're not anointed anymore. God is pushing you off. You'll never be married. Nobody wants you. You don't deserve this. But if grace, I'm not supposed to preach, is not about what you could deserve. If mercy is not about what you could deserve. If a, listen, listen, listen. Backslide and run away from God. 
Can we deal with the, 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 the sin, but not the conditioning, the condemnation? Satan is so afraid of you becoming the son. So he's got to use condemnation to keep you from accessing grace. Because the greater thing about sin is not just repentance. It's coming into grace. Okay, let me. Amazing grace. Now let me tell you this. <laughs> that song is actually about mercy. It is theologically inaccurate. Mercy is what spared you. Mercy didn't make you get consequences. Grace does not make accommodation for that. What grace does is change you so that you no longer have to do that. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound. So there is only one thing more powerful than sin and sinfulness, and it is grace or God's ability. But the best way to keep you out of grace, watch me, is to keep you living self-centered, self-seeking, selfish, self-conscious, based upon what you do or do not do. When the issue of getting close to God is not just stopping sinning, that's how you become religious and legalistic because you think God loves you more because you do it all right. But what happens is when you run after God every day to become one with Him, you stop sinning as a secondary consequence. When you focus your relationship with God on your sin, that you can't see His deliverance and His restoration and His hope. When you run to God, sit down. Yeah. Hallelujah. That's why repentance is about the changing of direction. Because old school Pentecost told me, don't do this, don't do that. But why they told you everything not to do, they didn't tell you what to do in the meantime. So you went back to doing what you thought you would do. Stop. Shift what you do on a daily basis to get more 
of him in you until you are so full of him that there is no room for none of that other stuff. And when Satan comes, he finds ample opportunity because there are empty spaces in your appetite and empty spaces in your love life and empty spaces. But I believe there's no room in the end. You've got to drink of the presence of God until the devil has no foot room to set in captives in your soul and in captives in your thinking and in captives in your emotions. Human beings reward arrival. Abba rewards progress. My wife and I were talking about this yesterday, but this is why so many Christians deal with perfectionism. God loves me when I get it right. <laughs> we were talking about this, you know, you get an A on your report card, I give you hundred dollars. You get a C, I give you nothing. I don't, you don't bring it in my house. There's nothing but excellence in here. And while that's not bad, I'm that type of dude too. You've got to develop an eye for progress. Yeah. What you do is when you only reward arrivals, you stagnate. You teach them never to aspire to be more. Just get it right. But there is a process between doing it and getting it right. If you don't believe that, stop practicing at choir rehearsals. Yeah. Don't practice to go to school. You know, when you live 30 years in darkness, you're not going to get holiness week too. Right. Jesus comes out of hiding as a man who was acquainted with the Father and he's got the weight of his burden on him for the world. He obeys God goes to his cousin John, and he gets baptized. At this point, the only thing he's done is read his Bible. Because when you're bar mitzvah at 12, in Jewish tradition, you have to know the entire law word for word. So most 12-year-olds in the Bible know more Bible than you. You have to know the complete law of Moses. Jesus didn't get a bar mitzvah at 12 because nobody knew who his daddy was. At a bar mitzvah, you put the 12 year old boy around you, your shoulders literally, and you move around the table seven times and you say, this is my beloved son, and who I'm well pleased. That's what they say about mitzvahs. Right. God postponed Jesus' bar mitzvah. He didn't give him one at 12, because Joseph couldn't do it. He gave him one at 30, but here's what blesses me. When Jesus was bar mitzvahed by heaven, he hadn't done anything. He hadn't died yet. He hadn't obeyed yet. He had not even had his first test. His first test came after he got out the pool. But God validated him before he did anything so that he wouldn't fit his ownership of him was based upon him changing water for water or him passing this test. He wanted to let you know, I'm going to claim you just because of who you are. I'm not going to ever act with you based upon what you do for me. So there is nothing you can do enough of or not enough of that's going to make me love you any less. I love you because of who I made you. And if you tap into who I made you, there will be millions of people that respond to what I made you to do. You get it good at what I'm calling you to do. But it's not until what I'm calling you to do. It's flowing from who I made you to be. If there's going to be endurance on that, this is why you got to say like Paul, not that I am boasted in anything that I've done with, but I am that I am and thank by the grace of God. Because grace is the only power that can make you what you need to be. It's not going to be rules. It's not going to be regulations. It's not going to be degrees. It's not going to be marital status. It's not going to be sexual orientation. It's when you develop enough courage in your Bible to decide to be what God wants you to be that yokes are broken off your mind. Chains are moved off your mind. Appetites are knocked out of your mind. Our conflict is that many of us have still not agreed 
with what God decided. <laughs> Our earthly fathers are inconsistent, yeah. not available. Now you see all of this in the word where Jesus is like, I'm a very present help. <laughs> it's not a text me when you need me. I'm around so that you never really need me. All you do is call. I'm ready. See, this is father language. He's like, before you call, I'll answer you. Your daddy is pressing if you know her on your phone. He don't want to be bothered with you because he's with his girlfriend. But, 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 but Jesus is not the kind of guy. I'm there. You are my priority. You want to see deliverance in your life? Realize how committed God is to you. God is not just there. He is committed to your success. Now this is difficult for many of you to conceptualize because you've never known a man to lay down his life to see to it that you succeed. But he is that type of God. David was about to fall. Watch your tone. He was about to fail under the hands of a generational curse. But even when he repented after Nathan and the cycle was broken, he went to bed one night and said, where can I go from your presence? If I make my bed in heaven, you're there. If I go to the lower parts of the earth, you're there too. If I decide I don't want you, you find a way to be there. You are a very present help. So we're not growing because we're not receiving from the part of God that is above. We're receiving from the Redeemer, the healer, the provider, the way out of the way, yeah. the bridge over troubled water. Yeah. Yeah. But his commitment, if you have an understanding that that's why he's rebuking you. Yeah. That's why he's allowing hardship on your life. He is committed to you and he desires to be inseparable. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Paul says, what can separate me? From the love of God. Height nor depth. Angels nor principality. Things in this world or things in the world to come. Nothing. Turn somebody say nothing. Nothing. Point somebody say nothing. Nothing. Nothing shall be able to separate you. When you live your life with separation anxiety, there are three things you're going to always find. Fear. Failure and abandonment. I got issues with being dropped. People not doing what they're supposed to do. Staying true to their word. Some of you don't know this, but you had a parent that died. So you never got the opportunity to experience that. Or you were adopted. Whatever the issue is, God wants to treat these ideas in you. Because it's in the way of how he's relating to you. Huh. You've never failed and sinned, come on, Reese, and decided you were not going to pray, or your reaction to a hard season was to quit. It's because you don't know the commitment of a father. God is committed to your success. He gave everything he had to ensure that you would be successful. But our fears and our limitations, because we don't see him as Abba. He's like, look, tell my people, I want to be so close to them. The, the, the strongest way to conceptualize how close God wants to be with you is by living in you and you living in him. That's the highest intimacy. So it's greater than sex. It's greater than having a confidant. We're going to live in each other. If you've had a silent father, one that's not been very affirming, then this stuff is challenging to you. It's confusing. It's not something that you conceptualize. My dad's the iron fist, and he needs to be, because God's got one too. My dad provided for the house, and he needs to be a man that don't work, but don't eat. But do you ever wonder what your life would be like if there was closeness? Would you think the same way about stuff in life? You can always tell when a person has not had the closeness of a father by how secure they are. Insecurities are the fruit of somebody that has known the voice of security. And the voice of security is articulated by one who takes responsibility for who you are. <laughs> God is breaking through 
barriers, the interferences, the fears, the abandonment to relate to you on a new level because he wants to settle your identity. Stand up. reaching in you, but it's good. It may feel new, but let it happen. God's got to deal with a lot of the lies that we believe about him to prepare us for our next level of responsibility. Because God's got a new responsibility for you. Hear the word of the Lord. He's calling you to do some things you've never done before. So he's got to resolve this in your life. Lift your hands. Father, in the name of Jesus. I thank you for every life here today, every story, every journey, every destiny. I thank you, Father, for the testimonies and the, the drills, the trials, the tests, the things that you have watched and been consistent and faithful that these people have went through. And Lord, I lift these hearts to you today. Many of them may have been shattered and unrecognizable pieces trying to figure out a way to function and trying to go through life searching and seeking without your voice and your word because of their unwarranted suspicions towards you. And Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, I release the power of this word to confront fear, the spirit of that orphan. Lord, you said in your word that we no longer have to live lives as those that have been dropped without security and without direction and without focus, but that through the power of grace we could cry, Abba, Father. Lord, let the spirit of adoption be released in this church. No longer allow us to find security and, uh, and, 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 and finality in our accomplishments, in our achievements, or our accolades, but God, help us to find security in the fact that you chose us from before the foundation of the world and that all that we do and all that we become is a secondary consequence of your selection of us. Heal these places in our lives and begin to woo, begin discussions with us. Wow. Begin discussions with us concerning who you made us to be. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Come on, give the Lord some praise. All the way to the Lord.